Thank you. Uh, thanks, Dee, and thanks for all the work preparing and the, um, you know, the work to uh, promote it. And I welcome all who are attending or who will uh, see this, the recorded version later. Um, this is an amended version of a presentation I gave in 2017 um, because it was already clear that there was a great danger of fascism with uh, as soon as you know as soon as Trump started talking uh, and running for office it was clear that this was something different than usual US politics um, so this is uh, similar but uh, I've also brought it up to date and talking about the current moment and uh, issues around the current election. Um, one of the difficulties I've had is that there's almost an embarrassment of riches. Just today, for example, there were um, a, a news article that the Department of Homeland Security sent a cyber expert to Portland to uh, clone the phones of activists, the cell phones, uh, and record them, hoping to find proof of planning terrorism. And this is a likely an illegal uh, wiretap, but uh, this is the kind of thing they're doing, this uh, breaking of the rules, breaking of the laws, spying on US citizens. So there's, these things are coming out all the time, or today's report from the New York Times about Trump's tax evasion over the last 15 years or so. Um, so, I'm not going to obviously include everything, uh, but I hope that I've included the most pertinent points and the most uh, pertinent issues of contention. So, I'm going to talk about um, what the current moment is, what the fascists seem to be doing, uh, what uh, the classic Marxist definition of fascism is, and some discussion about the current election. So this is from, obviously, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez um, and saw it the other day, and it seems to me to be exactly right. It's a vote to let our democracy lives, live another day, that mass movements are the answer. And indeed, that's worth repeating, mass movements are the answer because masses in motion constitute the only power strong enough to defeat fascism. Um, and these, that we, you know, we don't have to have preconceived notions of what masses in motion look like. There are many ways that they express themselves from demonstrations and protests and sign waving and mass marches, all the way up to civil disobedience, could be just petition campaigns, post, postcard campaigns, uh, voting, campaigning, all of those things are part of the mass movement of the moment, a mass movement against fascism. So as we, uh, you know, we're not the only ones worried about this. You open up your paper every day or go online or surf Facebook or whatever, and you uh, get, uh, it's the thing that has millions of people worried. Because people ask, you know, Hitler said what he was going to do in uh, Mein Kampf, his book. Why didn't people believe him? Well, Trump and those around him have been telling us what they want or plan to do or what they hope to get away with. They're laying the basis for legal challenges in any state. Uh, that uh, Trump loses, and they're already claiming fraud with no evidence before the fact, claiming that it's widespread, promising to send 50,000 election ob observers to intimidate voters and so much more. Uh, Trump has also repeatedly pledged in different circumstances to send US troops and or mercenaries into US cities. Um, he's excused, uh, right-wing vigilantes and their actual murder of people. He's threatened extrajudicial killings of protesters, and he's claimed now that ret retaliation is a valid excuse for police and militia violence and even for killing. Um, in addition to that, the, the rhetoric from Trump himself, but also from some of his supporters, 
uh, and his rallies and at other right-wing rallies is becoming incredibly violent, threatening to shoot protesters, shooting Democrats, shooting elected Democrats, shooting anyone they don't like, threatening entire urban areas. And that this is, uh, this is, they're telling us, and we should believe that they mean it. Now, it's also true that Trump says a lot of shit that we shouldn't believe. Uh, a lot of it is meant for distraction. It's meant to be shiny objects to distract us from what's really going on. But this is not just Trump. It's Trump and supporters and strat right-wing strategists. And they are saying out loud the stuff that they're not supposed to say out loud about what they're planning is. And we should believe that they mean it. We should take them at their word. He's also started claiming that only election day results matter, that any mail-in or absentee votes that come in after the election should not be counted. He said, get rid of the ballots. In service to this, uh, Senator Rick Scott from Florida has now introduced a bill, has no chance of passing both houses of Congress, but he's introduced a bill that all mail-in and absentee votes have to be counted within 48 hours of election day, which given the pandemic, given the fact that there will be tens of millions more mail-in and absentee ballots is ridiculous, uh, but they don't care about that. That's a, a bill that he's just introduced this week. And this shows their disdain for democracy, for the rule of law, for the constitution, and also for state laws, since state laws govern much of our election procedure. Each state has its own rules and its own laws, and many of them uh, allow uh, voters to uh, put their votes in the mail on election day as long as it's postmarked by that day, and they give, in many cases, weeks for the votes to be counted. Um, and there are some states where that happens quite a bit, and it will happen even more this time. So we won't know on election day who's won, but Trump is hoping uh, that the people who show up to vote in person will be primarily older and white, and therefore the day of election results will skew his way, and he can claim that anything that comes in later is fraud. He's giving himself cover. It lays the basis for contesting and ignoring the election results for things that he can claim. It doesn't matter if they make sense or if they're logical or if they contradict something he said, just two days before, he gives him a talking point. He's also said many times that he thinks he deserves a third term since he was, quote, treated so badly in his first term, unquote, and saying he plans to no negotiate for a third term in violation of the Constitution. And he's also mused about being president for life. And his advisor and uh, recent uh, 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 convicted felon, Roger Stone, publicly advised him on a, a right-wing talk radio a uh, few days ago that Trump should declare martial law if he doesn't win. And uh, a former Stone associate who's now an administration official, Michael Caputo, called on supporters to be ready for violence in the streets and advised them to buy ammunition. These are calls for civil war, and we should believe that they mean it. They're contemplating dirty tricks, for example, getting Republican-led state legislatures to appoint what's called faithless electors who will cast electoral votes for Trump, even if that is in contradiction to the election results of their state. Uh, and Trump said this past Wednesday that he, quote, I think this will end up in the Supreme Court, and I think it's very important to have nine justices in order not to have a tie. Well, he's only worried about that because Chief Justice Roberts, who's a right winger as much as any of them, has uh, flipped several times on several crucial votes. So they're not 100 percent sure that they'll win unless there's another ultra right wing vote on the Supreme Court. And he also has refused to promise to cooperate with the peaceful transfer of power. Uh, for the first time, any presidential candidate or president has made such a, a statement in the, the life of our country. So should, we should believe that they mean what they say they intend to do. 
There are other Republicans who've now come out and said, of course, Republicans will respect the results if they are if they are free and fair, but they're already claiming that the election is rigged. So that's word salad that doesn't really mean anything. We need to believe them when they tell us that Trump intends to maintain power at any cost. That doesn't mean that he will be able to, but that's his hope, plan, and intention. And while there are many common factors to fascist regimes around the world and over history, militarism, nationalism, rejection of democracy, brutality, uh, and a toxic stew of ideology, there's really only one fundamental principle for fascists, and that is power. Gaining power, maintaining power, imposing power, refusing to let go of power. And they won't hesitate, if they think they can get away with it, to use mass violence in the process. So there's an illusion among some on the left and indeed among some uh, liberal and centrist forces and among uh, Republicans who aren't total nuts, uh, that Trump is just, he's, he's a little worse than typical capitalist rule, but it's not fundamentally different. However, while they have engaged in fascist actions, full-blown fascism would be worse. And you only have to read about the history of Germany or Italy or Chile or any of the other countries that have experienced full-blown fascism. A military in the streets of the ma our major cities, opening concentration camps, summary execution of opponents, encouraging right-wing militias to engage in brutal violence in the streets, eliminating voting rights, eliminating congressional oversight, and jailing all political opponents, and even anyone deemed not a regular American. Um, certainly, uh, communists and socialists were among those who were sent to concentration camps in fascist Germany, but they also sent uh, millions of homosexuals and uh, Roma or gypsies and regular criminals and uh, uh, church people who were uh, not ready to sign on to be fascists. They sent all kinds of people uh, to concentration camps and to the gas chambers. So even though we are not yet to full-blown fascism, now is the time, right now, to fight all steps against democracy, against the rights to protest and to organize, and for programs that meet people's needs. That's that's a typo, that against. It's uh, to fight steps that they are taking against programs that meet people's needs. Now is the time to build lasting unity among many movements. Or as uh, uh, AOC said, let the times radicalize you. Mass resistance combined with a fight to address people's needs is the only way to reverse political direction in the US. So given that power is their uh, main purpose for existence, what do fascism, fascists use their grip on power to accomplish? They make structural and supposedly legal changes to protect their grip on power. They escalate the use of military force to impose conformity and to make the cost of protesting much higher so that people have to be ready for death even to go out in the streets to protest. They escalate their policies to cut taxes on the rich, cut programs for the poor, use the power of government to directly profit the capitalist sectors that support them. And uh, they're now planning to gut Social Security and Medicare and even do away with them. And they work to destroy the rights to free speech, to protest, to petition for redress of grievances, to peaceably assemble, and to be free from unwarranted government action, all supposedly guaranteed by our Constitution. So while Republicans have been doing this for quite some time, they've been chipping away at democracy in the states and in our federal government, the actions of the Trump administration and campaign are taking that to a more destructive level. 
There's attacks on the integrity of the elections and falsely claiming millions of fraudulent votes in 2016, 2018, and predicting that in 2020, even, even before anybody had voted. They continue to make voting more difficult. Uh, they're trying to destroy the ability of federal government agencies to enforce their rules. Uh, when they also are trying to eliminate most of those rules, that's particularly obvious at the EPA since they're uh, eliminating rules uh, against dumping toxic waste into drinking water. Uh, but it's true of many government agencies. And they're particularly turning the Department of Justice under Bill Barr into a blatant servant of Trump's interests, both his political interests and his personal interests, uh, deciding to weigh in on a, a rape trial where he's been accused of rape years before he was even a candidate for office. And what the Department of Justice has to do with that is mystifying, but they're going to join that suit on Trump's side. They're trying to destroy the postal system, uh, maybe as a precursor to privatizing it. Uh, but that's also part of their way to try and subvert the democratic process in this election. And they're trying to use all levers of power at their disposal to crush, crush opposition. And this is true not only of the popular movements and the mass demonstrations in all the cities of our country, but even to non-fascist elements of the ruling class or even uh, elements of the ruling class that are pretty right wing or pretty uh, subservient to him, but they're not fully engaged. In the same radio interview where Roger Stone called on Trump to um, declare martial law if he didn't win. He also suggested that Trump should ar arrest Mark Zuckerberg of Facebook and Tim Cook of Apple. Why Mark Zuckerberg, since uh, Facebook has been so uh, timid and unwilling to actually police Trump's uh, tweets and posts and the falseness that they spread everywhere. Some other examples of structural changes include uh, declaring New York City, Seattle, and Portland anarchist jurisdictions, whatever the hell that means. Uh, there's a proposed law that uh, Repu uh, Republican Governor Ron DeSantis of Florida proposed this week, which had a lot of terrible provisions, including making it legal to run over protesters with cars and to ban anything that they declare a disorderly assembly. Utah is pro prosecuting protesters utilizing anti-gang laws. Tennessee is, has already, uh, I'm sure it'll be challenged in court, but they've passed a law and signed by the Republican governor to take away voting rights from anybody uh, who's uh, accused of, of, who's convicted of being a protester. Uh, or bar using racketeering laws and old sedition laws against protesters in cities. And they pretend it's about violence, but they're, they're, this would be something that they would use broadly if they thought they could get away with it. And now we see they're trying to stack the Supreme Court on top of all the stacking of the federal judiciary that they've been engaged into uh, for uh, the, the totality of uh, Trump's administration. And they also are threatening funding for state and local governments that don't dominate the streets as Trump demands. And the, some of the changes like the the tax cuts and some of the um, benefits to businesses are for monetary profit and quick profit. But these structural changes are about power and the unrestricted use of power and uh, fiddling with the election laws and fiddling with the Department of Justice so that they can use it as a blunt instrument to bludgeon all opposition. So our fight to prevent fascism is about preventing the most vicious militarism and brutality being unleashed on tens of millions of the people who live in this country, unfettered by all constraints. This is not to say that terrible things aren't already happening. Uh, but because terrible things are already happening, some claim we already have fascism as if it can't get any worse. 
and they are wrong. Uh, Michelle Obama pointed this out in her speech to the Democratic uh, National Convention. It can get worse. Even though the things that they're already doing are terrible, there's a difference between the brutality of sending troops or mercenaries to the streets of Portland to kidnap, beat, uh, wiretap, and tear gas protesters, which indeed is terrible and a fascist action. There's a difference between that and rounding up thousands, imprisoning them in a sports stadium, and summarily executing them, as happened in Pinochet's Chile, uh, immediately as part of the coup that he uh, led. There's a difference between trying to rig the election and casting doubt on the validity of an election, which they are doing, and doing away with elections entirely. There's a difference between flaunting legality and imposing martial law. It can get worse, and that's what they will do if they think they can get away with it. So I have a lot of Dimitrov quotes in here. Here's the first one. Before the establishment of a fascist dictatorship, bourgeois governments usually pass through a number of preliminary stages and adopt a number of reactionary measures which directly facilitate the accession to power of fascism. Whoever does not fight the reactionary measures of the bourgeoisie and the growth of fascism at these preparatory stages is not in a position to prevent the victory of fascism but on the contrary, facilitates that victory. So who is this guy, Georgi Dimitrov? He was a Bulgarian communist who worked for the Communist International as a representative to the German Communist Party. As part of the Nazis' provocation of burning the Reichstag, the, their parliamentary building, he was arrested and charged with that, along with several of his, um, uh, his co-workers, along with uh, the guy who the Nazis tricked into um, maybe setting one piece of the fire. We don't know all the details. Uh, but he used the trial to put the Nazis on trial. Uh, he called Hermann Goering to the stand and embarrassed him and prodded him to lose his temper and make uh, illegal threats. And he ended up being acquitted in a fascist court uh, it was both his own eloquence and his own trial strategy, but also a worldwide campaign to free him. Dimitrov became the head of the Communist International after that, and he gave the main report to the Seventh Congress of the Communist International in 1935. Uh, and that's where most of my quotes come from that report, which summed up the experience several years or even more than a decade in Italy. Uh, the experience of communists around the world fighting fascism. And it explained the shift in strategy from a leftist third period strategy to a united front, popular front approach, uh, paving the way for the ultimate defeat of fascism in Europe. And after World War II, he became the first uh, head of socialist Bulgaria. So as uh, we've already I've already mentioned, it can and will get worse if we refuse to campaign and vote, if we hold ourselves apart from the struggles of tens of millions who still expect democracy to work, or they still at least hope it will work. Uh, it can and will get worse if we don't plan to take to the streets in the event of a coup, if we don't take full advantage of splits in the ruling class, and if we don't understand that as materialists, we have to recognize objective reality, which is that if Trump is going to de be defeated in this election, it will be by votes for Biden. That's not a revisionist fantasy. That's the actuality. And we have to start our strategy from understanding the actuality of what we're dealing with. So voting matters. If voting doesn't matter, why are they working so hard to make it difficult? Why are they sending 50,000 supposed monitors to the polls with the attention, intention of intimidating voters? They've already attempted this in Virginia with the first days of early voting, where they uh, 
sent a, a little demonstration to stand outside and they had to be pushed away to comply with the legal requirements for any partisan political activity to stay at least 40 feet away. In some states it's 60. Different rules apply in different places, but they've already tried it and they're planning to do much more of that. If voting didn't matter, why are they trying to make counting the votes so difficult? Why are they already planning legal attacks on the election results? Why are they throwing so many voters off the rolls? In Georgia alone, it's been hundreds of thousands of voters who've been thrown off the rolls. If you take uh, Republican efforts by Republican secretaries of state across the country, it's millions of voters. So there will undoubtedly be people who try and get a mail-in ballot or an absentee ballot or who show up in person who will have to uh, cast provisional votes or who will be discouraged from voting because it already appears that they're not registered voters because they've been thrown off the rolls. Why are they doing this if voting didn't matter? They know that legit legitimacy of the government rests right now on at least the pretense of democracy, and they badly want to claim that legitimacy long enough that they can implement full-blown fascism. Our fight to prevent fascism is not just about Trump. It's about protecting the possibility of peaceful change. Uh, as Angela Davis said recently, the Trump the Biden administration, excuse me, the Biden administration is more likely to respond to progressive pressure. But our strategy does not rest on whether or not the Democrats will move to the left. Our immediate strategy goals are to save the constitutional rights to protest, to freely assemble, to petition for redress of grievances, to free speech, to maintain and strengthen democracy, to create change ourselves. If we want to have those possibilities, that requires that we defeat fascism. The need for political space to organize for change and expand democracy is not dependent on what the Democrats do or don't do. There are many arguments, oh, Biden said this so many years ago, or he's planning this. There are many positive things. There's many negative things but our strategy does not depend on what the Democrats will or will not do. It's about protecting our own, own right to be active and engage citizens and to engage in protest and political change. As Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez has said, November is about defeating fascism. And as Senator Bernie Sanders has said, this election is between Trump and democracy. So now we come to what is the essence of fascism. Uh, there have been various historians and thinkers and writers who've often offered, offered a variety of definitions and explanations that fascism is the result of the dispossessed middle classes, that um, this is because of the great man theory. It was all about Hitler and his personality and his psyche and what he wanted or didn't want. Or now it's all about hit Trump and his psyche and his personal desires or his personal charisma or lack thereof. Or another is that fascism is just the rule of barbarism in politics. And these all have a bit of the truth. They're not uh, made up, they're looking at at least one part of reality. Fascism does base its mass appeal on the perceptions, prejudices, and perce perceived needs of the middle classes and workers and the supposed wrongs done to them or done to the country uh, and thus to them. So this idea that it's the revolt of the dispossessed middle classes or the dispossessed middle classes and workers has an element of truth. The great man theory does have an element of truth because fascism ends up with the dictatorship of an individual and builds a personality cult around that individual. So that individual does play an outsized role in the development of history. So that has an element of truth in it. And it's also true that fascism is barbarism in politics, both in words and in deeds. 
However, none of these explain how fascism is different from other right-wing trends or why it results to barbarism in politics, nor which sections of the capitalist class fascism serves. Uh, Dimitrov said, fascism is not a form of state power standing above both classes. Fascism is the power of finance capital itself. And that's even more true now than it was in the 1930s. Uh, for some obvious examples, just look at some of Trump's cabinet members filled with millionaires and billionaires exercising power directly, not just through their minions or through their lobbyists or through their lawyers. Some examples include Betsy DeVos at the Department of Education who got a chunk of her money from charter schools. She's the sister of Eric Prince, the millionaire founder of Blackwater and I'm not sure how it's pronounced, Z, which are mercenary firms. Louis DeJoy at the Postal Service, who made his money in transportation logistics. Sonny Perdue, the Secretary of Agriculture, who comes from chicken money. Rex Tillerson, no longer Secretary of State, but brought in. Uh, he was the head of ExxonMobil, which many have said is was so large and so powerful, it had its own foreign policy. Wilbur Ross, the Secretary of Commerce. I, Sorry, I didn't bring up where his money comes from, but he's uh, a, an octogenarian wheeler dealer. Or Steve Mnuchin, the Secretary of the Treasury, who made his money in banking, especially foreclosures during the 20, 2008 recession. Of course, both Republican and Democratic administrations have had millionaires in the cabinet before, but this is at a new level. And it's um, also uh, helped by other appointees who may not be as personally rich, but their job has been to destroy the departments that they lead from the National Labor Relations Board or the Environmental Protection Agency, or to turn their leadership of those departments into lapdogs for Trump, as Barr is doing at the Department of Justice, or to water down recommendations and decisions as has been shown recently to have happened at the Center for Disease Control in the middle of a pandemic when we need them more than ever. Or they have appointed just to be incompetent, like Ben Carson at HUD or Rick Perry at Energy. So this classic Marx Marxist definition of fascism comes from Dimitrov's report to the Seventh Congress of the Communist International. And it developed in the course of actual political experience, fighting fascism in several countries, not only Germany, but also Italy, Spain, Austria, and Portugal, and fighting fascists in many other countries. And this definition of fascism is not based on what fascists say about themselves, nor what is included in their electoral programs or their public claims. It's based on what fascism and fascists actually do, on the policies they implement when they have full power. So here is that classic definition. The open terrorist dictatorship of the most reactionary, most chauvinistic, and most imperialist elements of finance capital. So I'm gonna break this down into each of its component parts the open terrorist dictatorship means the abrogation of all legal democratic possibilities for protest and opposition. It means the naked use of power, including military power and street violence for political ends. And it means not just the ordinary succession of one normal bourgeois government by another, but the power of finance capital itself, organizing terrorist repression and vengeance against the working class. The next part of that definition is um, of the most reactionary, most chauvinistic, and most imperialist elements. These sections of the capitalist class throw their support to the fascist movement at crucial points taking advantage of fascist brutality to maintain their profits, their dominant position in the economy, and their political control. 
and it is not the capitalist class as a whole which prefers, uh, which chooses fascism and prefers it to choose it at certain points. Most capitalists, even big ones, prefer to rule using bourgeois democracy. One of the reasons for that is that bourgeois democracy provides a cover, a democratic cover for what they want to do. But there's another element to it also. Uh, bourgeois democracy allows the different sections and different interests within the capitalist class to work out their differences peaceably. Uh, and uh, fascism destroys that possibility even for sections of the capitalist class. So for that reason, there are, there's a section of the capitalist class which is opposed to Trump and opposed to many of the things that he is in the process of trying to do to us. And this is the group of finance capital. So not just random reactionary capitalists, though there are plenty of those, but it's uh, this section of finance capital, which is crucial to fascists achieving power, the corrupt sections who make their money through speculation, through loans, through stock speculation, through currency manipulation, and from uh, support from the corporations that they control. And that's also shown by who their policies most benefit. Uh, the capitalist class is much broader than the top 1% or even the top one tenth of 1%. But the top tenth of 1% is who gained the bulk of the benefit from Trump's tax cuts. Um, the top one tenth of 1% is who financially benefits from most of what Trump has done, uh, economically speaking. It's not the unified reaction of the entire ruling class. Again, from Dimitrov, fascism usually comes to power in the course of a mutual and at times severe struggle against the old bourgeois parties or a definite section of those parties in the course of a struggle even within the fascist camp itself. Fascism impresses the masses by the vehemence of its attacks on the bourgeois governments and its irreconcilable attitude to the old bourgeois parties. And this can explain some of the vehemence with which Trump attacked mainstream Republican leaders and other candidates in the 26 uh, presidential uh, debates. He was vicious to some of them. Um, and that's uh, an example of this. He's fighting against those elements of the, of the capitalist class that are not ready to choose brutality in the streets and the elimination of democracy. So what if, if it's not just about Trump's personality and not just about whether he wants to be brutal or not, uh, but it's a broader social and economic issue, what are the conditions that open the door to fascism? Uh, it's when the ruling class can no longer rule in the old way. The system has become delegitimatized. Um, and the old ways of working no longer suffice to maintain bourgeois power. And when the working class movement is not yet strong enough or united enough to actually take power, but is strong enough to be a credible threat to capitalist rule. Um, what happened in Chile is an example of this. The left in the election of Allende in 1970 uh, didn't win state power. They won a foothold on state power. And the part of the aim of the popular unity government was through the process of governing and campaigning to grow their support. And that was indeed happening. The popular unity candidates increased their percentage of popular support in the votes that happened between 1970 and 1973. Uh, so it was becoming not just a, a, a credible threat, it was the threat of their being able to reach a majority and be able to change the constitution to benefit the working class was a serious threat to all capitalist power. So that's what happened in Chile. So it was a strong, strong enough to win elections, but not strong enough to win full state power yet. And the mass fascist movement, the support 
or the votes for fascists is big enough and strong enough to take the steps that we're seeing them take, to take steps to limit and uh, cause problems for democratic control, for democratic votes, for the normal bourgeois politics to work. And the mass fascist movement is also big enough and strong enough to create a political crisis, violence in the streets, which fascism solves for the ruling class. Part of the pitch of the capitalists, of, uh, I'm sorry, part of the pitch of the fascists to the big capitalists is that there is chaos in the streets and if you wanna keep making profits and have a stable enough society to keep making profits, you have to choose us. And the, the proof of that is the violence in the streets. Uh, while Hitler in the years before uh, he actually uh, was appointed chancellor, uh, spent a lot of his time uh, at mass rallies building up the mass vote and mass support for fascism. He spent his a lot of time behind the scenes courting uh, industrial and financial leaders of Germany and courting uh, the military uh, leadership of Germany behind the scenes to tell them that he was not a threat to them and they should support him. And at crucial points in Germany, uh, they threw their support to him and that proved decisive. Uh, Hindenburg, the president of Germany, or the, yeah, the president, uh, the day before he appointed Hitler chancellor, he said he would never appoint Hitler chancellor. He was not going to do that, but they brought the right pressure at the right time from the right powerful elements of both the military and the financial and industrial leadership of Germany and changed over the course of one day uh, his mind and he appointed Hitler chancellor. So the fascist pitch to these capitalists and to these militarists is that there's chaos in the streets we will unleash the military and we will allow you to continue to profit and create a stable enough situation for you to continue to profit and to rule the country. So in case you haven't noticed, which I assume most of you have, these fit with five of the signature accomplishments of the Trump administration. The tax cuts for the obscenely wealthy. Uh, I saw a note on Facebook the other day where somebody posted, uh, have you noticed that none of the Republicans running for office are uh, proclaiming loudly about what uh, a great victory the tax cuts were? That's because they're highly unpopular, because they benefited the top one-tenth of one percent, because they provided virtually nothing to the vast majority of the population. So even though it was one of their signature accomplishments, they're, they're not talking about it because it will not help them, even though it does help them with their financial backers. Another accomplishment was to uh, avoid, manage to avoid strict oversight of the stimulus funds by the Treasury Department, uh, leaving the Treasury Secretary, Steve Mnuchin, uh, free reign to give uh, loan, supposed loans, which will never be called in, to whomever he wanted without full oversight by Congress, even though Congress demanded it, uh, which meant free money to many of his cronies and supporters, including loans to evangelical churches and right-wing think tanks and uh, all kinds of uh, sketchy operations. Uh, there's even uh, a report that the Catholic Church got $3.5 billion in loans as part of that, and there's no oversight to that. So those two things are direct financial benefits to either sections of the ruling class or to the entire ruling class. And part of that was an effort to win those who don't support Trump, to buy them off, to placate them, or to at least neutralize them. Uh, but the next three accomplishments are of the structural kind. The deluge of right-wing judges who are confirmed to lifetime appointments, including the ongoing effort right now to stack the Supreme Court to be 
not just conservative, but ultra conservative for decades to come. The destruction of many regulations and funding for enforcement and uh, programs that aid the poor. And escalating attacks on democracy, voting, public accountability, legality, the right to protest. So that's what they've been doing, and that is all to lay the basis for full-blown fascism. And given that, it means that we should not confuse the mass voting bloc for ultra-right politicians with the fascist political leaders. What they say in public and what they um, say to win support from millions of people is different from what they say to themselves and the reasons that they plan to do those things. Lots of the stuff that they say in public makes no sense at all. It's, it's word salad gibberish. Uh, if you've actually tried to read any of Trump's speeches, they're verging on incoherent. Uh, that doesn't mean that the policies themselves don't make sense. It means we have to recognize that the key force for fascism is not the mass of voters, no matter, matter how rabid some of them are. The main key force is finance capital itself. And it means that a united working class front as the center of a broad popular front coalition is the key to defeating fascism. And I'll just make a, a, a tangent here. United front and popular front are often used interchangeably and that's okay. Uh, Dimitrov uses them in specific ways, but that doesn't have to be something that we worry about. So looking at the fascist movement, we have to recognize that it has many component parts, not all of which are equal. Uh, there's Trump, his ego, his immediate family, and uh, his minions, both in his uh, companies and in the White House and in all of the agencies. There's the strategists and policy makers, including Steve Bannon, Stephen Miller, Bill Barr, Chad Wolf, Betsy DeVos, Eric Prince, and many more. There are the super rich who fund his campaign and fund the mass aspects of the fascist movement. The, the people who pay so that the Proud Boys can uh, ship their supporters uh, to Portland to engage in protests. They can't, they don't fund that themselves. They're funded by millionaires and billionaires. Uh, the Mercers, Sheldon Adelson, the Koch Empire, and uh, their ilk. Um, there was just a protest by the Proud Boys in Portland yesterday, and they had claimed that there were going to be thousands showed up, and they had two to three hundred, and they were dwarfed by the counter protesters. But somebody is paying for those protests. They pay for the buses, they pay for flying people around the country, um, they pay to fund the, uh, the street troops, so to speak. Another element is the extreme right media, not just Fox News with Hannity and Carlson, but also uh, this right wing network OANN and the talk wing, talk, the right wing talk radio, Limbaugh, Alex Jones, and many, many more. The Sinclair network of TV stations, which has bought up TV, small TV stations, local TV sta stations around the country and requires them to run their canned pro-Trump supposed news stories. Uh, but And also the right-wing social media outlets. that They have become very sophisticated at uh, using uh, Facebook and Twitter and all, all of the social media in ways that um, sometimes promote the growth of their movement in ways that everybody on the, that social media doesn't necessarily see. There are the Republicans in Congress and in the states, some of whom are part of the movement and others who have just sold their souls in return for power or for right ring judges or for tax cuts or just for not getting primary from the right. Another component part, an important component part, is the mass of Trump voters, those have, who have been sold a demagogic bill of goods and the fascist stormtroopers who are the street soldiers not to be confused with the mass of Trump voters 
consists of a relatively small militia and street fighting groups, and they profess a toxic stew of muddled incoherent ideology, and they act with a commitment to street violence against all components. The, this, these small groups are several hundred or several thousand, while the, there are indeed millions of Trump voters. Uh, but the stormtroopers in the streets are the ones who are creating the street violence, trying to create a, the, a violence in the streets chaos uh, that the, the uh, fascists will claim they are the only ones uh, who can solve that. Some of those are the Proud Boys, the Boogaloo Boys, the Prayer Patriots, the QAnon cultists, the Oath Keepers, the Patriot Coalition, and other violent conspiracy mongers. And they proclaim uh, the various elements of odd and incoherent and fascist ideology. There's a great replacement theory that uh, all the immigration is about people coming in to replace all the white people. Uh, or they're regurgitating old anti-Semitic lies about, now they're saying it's, oh, it's Democrats allied with the Jews who are drinking the blood of babies. Uh, there are claims that we saw a lot of in 2018, claims of illegal immigrant convoys getting ready to invade. Uh, this was all over the news and all over social media before the 2018 midterms and then vanished the, the minute the midterms were over. It was made up like all of this stuff. There's, they proclaim that there's a race war coming and we have to be ready for it. And they welcome the idea of race war and they try and instigate it. And then there's this other thing I hadn't heard of before called the Bronze Age, Bronze Age Mindset, which advocates female submission, uh, claiming uh, biblical sources and also glorification of supposed warrior culture from the Middle Ages as uh, what we should aspire to. So this is a, a lot of nonsense, but they sell a lot of nonsense, each piece of it trying to hook another group of gullible voters. Fascism does not have a fixed ideology, though they proclaim they do. They make a great public stance of how strong their beliefs are. Everything Trump does is strongly. He strongly supports or he strongly opposes or he strongly claims. Um, but his ideology is not fixed. As we have seen in the past, there have been times where he strongly proclaimed something and then backed down in the face of serious opposition. As Togliati makes clear in his book, Lectures on Fascism, uh, fascist parties such as the Italian fascisti, the brown, brown shirts and black, uh, brown shirts were in Germany, black shirts in Italy, sorry. Uh, the, brown, the black shirts did not operate from a fixed set of principles, but they did a lot of tacking and weaving to mollify restive sections of the populace. At one point, in order to uh, gain support from the agrarian economy, they they proposed uh, laws and bills that gave benefit to that section of the economy in the hopes of gaining votes and support, or at least neutralizing that section. At another time, they ignored them entirely. So they tacked and weaved all according to their main and really only principle, gaining and maintaining and building power. They use a fascist ideology, which as I've said, is a cobbled together toxic stew of nationalism, racism, authoritarianism, militarism, and a few faux populist appeals thrown in so that they can continue to claim that they are working for the people. You see, it saw a lot of this from Trump in 2016. Uh, and there's a note about who Togliatti was, uh, leader of the Italian Communist Party for many decades during uh, uh, fascism in Italy, during World War II and following. Uh, in Dimitrov, in looking back in 1935 at the, at uh, what happened in Germany in 1933 and before, and what happened in Italy in 1922 and before, 
said in our ranks, in other words, in the ranks of the Communist Party and among leftists, there was an impermissible underestimation of the fascist danger, how dangerous it was, how terrible it was, how much different it was from normal bourgeois rule. In part, that uh, happened because, as I've said, talk, uh, fascist ideology often doesn't make any sense. It's self-contradictory, it's nonsense, it's bizarre claims, it's uh, made up shit all over the place. Uh, but that underestimation also comes in other forms. In our country right now, it can take the form of saying, there's no difference between the terrible things that have been going on and how bad it would get with full blown fascism. We already have fascism. And they say that even though there is still democratic public room to protest and demonstrate. They're trying to take that away from us, but we still have that room and we need to take advantage of every inch of available democratic space in order to prevent it from becoming full-blown fascism. Another form it takes is advocating that we ignore differences within the capitalist class because they're all the capitalist enemy and thus uh, leading us to not take advantage of splits in the capitalist class. So that, those are parts of that impermissible underestimation of the fascist danger that we see today. Dimitrov's and the Communist Party and the Communist International's approach was to shift policy to a popular front, united front approach. So I'm gonna talk about that a little bit. Um, the fight to protect and extend democracy is the basis, in my opinion, for making the broadest alliances right now. Because it bases itself on a long history in the US of struggles to extend democracy. Um, the Constitution originally limited democracy and the vote to white male property owners. And a large part of our history has been the fight to continually extend and expand that democracy. So using that as the basis for our broad alliances puts us uh, at the center of US culture, even if some of it um, is uh, mythology, it's still a powerful force in US politics that we need to take advantage of, in my opinion. Again, Dimitrov quoted Lenin, uh, saying that Lenin had in mind the fundamental law of all great revolutions, the law that for the masses, propaganda and agitation alone cannot take the place of their own political experience. We want to draw increasingly wide masses into the revolutionary class struggle, proceeding from their vital interests and needs as the starting point and their own experience as the basis. Masses in motion, as AOC said, in struggle, mass movement, that's the path on which workers and allies gain experience and knowledge and work out any difficulties. Without their own experience, workers will not learn why what we say matters. They will not be ready to forge the necessary alliances and they will not be ready for the risks of struggle. Struggle is a risk and uh, the fascists are raising those risks exponentially higher and workers have to understand that we have the possibility and potential of defeating fascism, else they will not be ready to take the risks, not enough of them. So I think I would describe our job as to be organized optimists, to base ourselves on a materialist approach to reality, not on what we wish or hope. Not look at reality through rose-colored glasses, but grapple with difficult, contentious, and often harsh reality. To be optimists, looking at the struggles of today for ways to unite and expand the movements, project a better future, and to base ourselves on the working class and its interests but we don't just hope for a better future. We plan and work to make it happen. We become organized optimists. 
there's been a lot of debate ever since Trump was elected and continuing today about violence. Uh, many have asked the question, is it moral to punch fascists? Um, and it's my contention that that's the wrong question, that violence as a tactic alienates the very millions we need to win in order to defeat fascism. So if you look at history, there were pitched street battles between the militias in Germany. There were militias associated with the Nazi party, with the Communist Party, with the Socialist Party, or the Social Democratic Party, even with other right-wing and centrist parties. They all had their own militias filled with ex-service members. And they held pitched battles in the streets over the years leading up to full-blown fascism. And the fascists welcomed those even when they lost the street battles. As I've said, they used that chaos as an argument that they're the only ones who can provide stability. That's work, why they work so hard to provoke and instigate it. All those proud boys, all those two or 300 proud boys in Portland yesterday didn't come from Portland. It wasn't a spontaneous thing from uh, Portland right wingers. Uh, they were shipped in um, to instigate violence, to instigate provocations, to instigate um, battles in the street, even if they lost them, because they welcome it. They're auditioning to be martyrs for Trump. Uh, chaos in the streets aids fascism. And this is from a, a, a book uh, by some Germans published by international publishers in 1945, The Lesson of Germany. Before Hitler's accession to power, tens of thousands of workers, both social democrats and communists, in their militant organizations did not capitulate to reaction. They stood their ground against the Nazi gangs. Throughout 1932, Bloody clashes occurred all over Germany between Nazi stormtroopers on one side and communists and social democrats on the other side. Characteristically, the local authorities always sent the police to help the Nazis. And we see echoes of that today in many cases uh, with Kyle Rittenhouse uh, marching around with uh, Kenosha with uh, a, a, a semi-automatic weapon welcomed and and given encouraging remarks from the police let go after he murdered people in front of them only arrested later after he returned to his home in illinois uh, and this is from a review in the new yorker of a forthcoming book about uh, what fascists do the fascist italian dictator before he ascended to power in october 1922 exploited violent clashes between groups of supporters known as black shirts and their left-wing opponents. He used the violence to destabilize Italian society so he could position himself as the person to stop this violence. This is a conscious part of their strategy. And part of what I'm leading up to is that it is not, it is necessary, absolutely necessary, to be militantly anti-fascist, but that is not enough. We also need a smart reality-based strategy, which starts with acknowledging that if Trump is going to be defeated at the ballot box, it will have to be by votes for Biden. We don't have to like that. We don't have to love Biden to understand that that is our reality. We don't have any guarantee that Biden will bow to pressure and move left, though he might, and there are things uh, both in the platform that he is running on and in the works of what he's projecting his policies to be and in the economic and public healthcare crisis that we're experiencing uh, that may help indeed pressure him to move to the left, but we don't have any guarantee of it. But uh, that doesn't impact our basic strategic calculations. As I will discuss later, voting is not the end goal of our strategy. Voting is not all that is needed in order to defeat fascism. But it is a field of struggle that the left should not abandon or play games with. It is the, just the next step in the struggles ahead of us. 
The key point of building unity is the struggle against racism. And the biggest obstacle to unity is the promotion of racism by the ultra right. They have escalated their uh, racism of their words, of their actions, of their deeds. Um, and it's the main way, though not the only way, in which they appeal to a mass base, to the racism that has been uh, promoted for centuries uh, among the populace. Racism is also uh, promoted because it unites ultra-right movements. All those different street uh, stormtrooper groups that I mentioned, they don't all agree with each other or have think exactly the same thing or plan exactly the same thing, but racism is the main thing that unites them all. And racism also is the main thing that divides people's movements, the masses in the millions. It's the main obstacle to building the necessary alliances and coalitions and working partnerships. Without multiracial unity against racism, all the other battles and alliances will be weakened. And it also is true that anti-racist, anti-police violence and Black Lives Matter movements are at historic levels of support by many millions and by majorities in many places. So it's not only a necessary struggle, it's a winning struggle. We can win millions of people to the struggle against anti-fascism by fighting against racism. And we can divide our opponents and build our own strength in the process. Just as our working class is multiracial, multinational, multigender, multigenerational, so too the movement to defeat the steps towards fascism must be multiracial, multinational, multigender, multigenerational. We can conceptualize that unity by thinking about the actual movements that are going on and how to connect them and how to link them, how to uh, convince people that their issues are linked and ways in which they can support each other, whether it's the environmental movement or the Black Lives Matter movement or the Fight for 15 or the union movement or the women's health movement or many other movements that are already in process and have the support of millions of people. And how do we connect those movements and the organizations of those movements? We can also conceptualize it as building unity and alliances between the core forces for change, labor and the entire working class, people of color, women and youth, and around that, a broader people's movement. And around that, even more temporary alliances with all anti-fascist forces, even including some sections of the ruling class. So why do we need to vote to defeat Trump? First, imagine if Trump is able to squeak out a tiny, tiny popular vote victory or even a popular vote loss, but an electoral college win as happened in 2016. That will enable him and his supporters to claim victory and pretend they have a mandate for fascist policies. A landslide defeat, on the other hand, would place our struggle in the best position, no matter what Trump does after the election, regardless of whether he respects the election results or not, regardless of whether they take states to court or not, regardless of whether they institute street violence. A landslide defeat puts us in the best position, no matter what Trump does. Second, there are important races for Congress and state legislatures. And that what's true for the presidential race is also true in those. They will continue to use any victory, however small, as an excuse to continue these steps towards fascism, destroying voting rights, criminalizing protest, uh, gerrymandering uh, following the census. Um, you know, there are many, many more examples than I have time for, uh, but they're mess, trying to mess with the census and cut it off prematurely, all in the interests of being able to claim uh, phony victories. Third, we need to vote against Trump because any, tr any result that lets them maintain their stranglehold on national and state governments 
will enable them to stop moves in a progressive direction. If Biden wins, but the uh, Republicans maintain control of the Senate, Mitch McConnell will do as he did during the eight years of the Obama administration, use his position to prevent any and all progress, even limited progress, even tiny steps towards progress will be prevented. So uh, we need to vote to defeat Trump and to defeat McConnell and to defeat all Republicans in the Senate and Republicans in the control of state legislatures and governorships. Fourth, part of this broad strategy approach is that we have to be with the people fighting side by side because tens of millions of them are opposed to fascism. Tens of millions of them want a government that actually works for their benefit, that works to solve the pandemic, that works to tax the rich, that works to provide new jobs, that works to build a renewable energy economy. But they are not necessarily progressive and certainly not revolutionary yet. So we have to be with them in the process where they are at, where they see their own needs and their own struggle. And the labor movement and many civil rights movements, including Black Lives Matter, LGBTQ organizations, women's rights and health groups, the climate change strike movement, um, the uh, the anti-gun movement started by the Parkland students, they're all actively engaged in the electoral process. So we need to be with them in that struggle. Trump doesn't want us to vote. Uh, there are particular Trump reasons as opposed to just fascist reasons. His legal jeopardy for crimes will escalate, escalate dramatically once he is no longer president. Uh, there will be court cases for and are for everything from rape and sexual harassment to viola violating the emoluments clause to tax evasion to bank and insurance fraud. He also has huge legal jeopardy in state courts. The state of New York is taking him to court on many issues from uh, taxes to uh, uh, bank and insurance fraud. And uh, he even now does not have um, immunity from those, but he can only avoid that by a fascist elimination of the legal independence of states. He doesn't want us to vote. He's already proven that he does not respect anything, not votes, laws, norms, customs, expectations, morals, ethics, constitution. He doesn't respect the military. He doesn't respect even other members of the ruling class that he should be trying to win to his side. And like fascists everywhere, Trump and those who support him are only committed to one thing, naked power, and they will not easily nor willingly give it up. That's not a reason to abstain from voting. That's a reason to be prepared for the struggle right after the election day, all the way up to after inauguration day, and then struggles for more progressive goals after that. We have to be prepared for the struggle after the election. They're already claiming voter fraud, already claiming that all mail-in ballots are invalid or fraudulent, claiming that the election is rigged, even as Republican secretaries of state are in charge of elections in many of those states. Uh, the Trump campaign, as part of their preparation, is bombarding local election officials uh, with detailed questions about their procedures, how they do mail ballots, how they do voter registration, uh, how they check any of this laying the groundwork for massive legal challenges to the votes in many, many states. And there's a link to a Rolling Stone article about this. And these uh, efforts that they're making, that they're spending money and time and effort on are not about winning the election. They're about their ability to sow confusion and anger and delay afterwards, maybe even planning for a violent provocation by fringe elements. And these efforts are funded by right-wing millionaires and billionaires who care, uh, care for profits and power and hate democracy. Even the limited 
partial democracy that we have had. So as we've noted, the struggle will continue even if Biden wins. Even in the event of a Biden-Harris win and if Trump actually leaves office, which is still the most likely outcome. He can bluster all he wants, but that doesn't mean he has the undivided support of the military, for example, to be able to impose his will. Uh, but the forces that he has unleashed and encourages, those street troops, will still be with us. The demagogy that he has sold will still be with us, and they will still be trying to cause destruction and chaos. Another reason is that the Biden program, while a significant improvement on what we've experienced with Trump, will require mass pressure to pass. Uh, it requires masses in motion, mass movements to force the political system to respond to our needs. And the Biden program, even uh, as limited as it might be in some respects, will require mass pressure to pass it. And even the best elements of that program are not enough to solve climate change or to change racist policing or to go past ending voter suppression to radically expanding democracy and democratic control. Democratic, small d democratic control of policy and implementation. Another reason is that there will be pressure even from some anti-fascist elements of the Biden coalition for him not to prosecute Trump and his minions for their crimes in the interests of national unity. We've seen that in 20, in uh, 2000 with the, the, the uh, Bush-Gore election. There was pressure, don't continue to fight this, and uh, Gore bowed to that pressure. Only millions in the street can apply enough countervailing pressure. And Biden's foreign policy will not be progressive in most respects, and we will need to oppose US imperialism through mass actions. The struggle will continue. They will have limited political capital and have to choose how to use it. Uh, Obama, though it was part of his election program, uh, never worked to pass the Employee Free Choice Act, which would have fundamentally changed US politics by expanding union membership dramatically. He instead used what political capital he had to get health care reform. And it did indeed, I'm not, this is not a criticism, it did indeed take a lot of political capital to pass health care reform and to boost the economy back from disaster, the disaster of the 2008 Great Recession. Uh, but there will be pressure on Biden to not implement all aspects of what he's campaigning on. And Republicans will still be in control of many state legislatures and they will resist all progressive policies. And in particular, the climate crisis requires massive changes in all aspects of our lives uh, even more than are required by solving the pandemic. And many Democrats will be reluctant or even obstruct those changes. So the struggle will need to continue. So in summary, the danger of full-blown fascism is increasing and that has to affect our strategy. Fascism is not just a variant of typical capitalist rule. Fascism is in large part about eliminating democracy, criminalizing protest, and crushing dissent. The fight for democracy is the broadest basis on which to build unity. Our election strategy is not an election only strategy. The struggle will continue no matter what happens on election day. And masses in motion gain their own experience in the process of struggle and masses in motion are the only way to defeat fascism. So I uh, wanna put this up here, but anybody who wants these links can email me. I'll put my own email address up in just a second uh, to get, if you wanna get these uh, links to efforts that are already underway to prepare for at the day after, so to speak, for protests uh, in the streets, if there's in the event of a coup of 
one kind or another. Um, so I urge you to sign the pledges and uh, pledge to go out into the streets and be ready to take action no matter what Trump does. Uh, if you'd like a copy of this, uh, the full slideshow includes a couple more slideshows that I'm not going to show you today uh, with book recommendations and article recommendations. And you can email me at this email address uh, and just ask for a copy of the PowerPoint presentation. You can also check out my webinar on the same subject from 2017, which covers many of the same issues, but is obviously not up to date. But it also covers some other myths about fascism and some language and definition issues. And here's the link for uh, that presentation. Uh, I wasn't going to show that, so I'm going to go back. So those that's my presentation. I'm sorry I've taken so long, but there's a lot to cover. And the floor is open for questions, uh, comments, and uh, I'm sorry, we have a little time, but not a lot, but I welcome your comments or your emails. Uh, Mark, would you show the link, uh, um, show the slide that uh, has the, uh, so that people can in, in use the recording as a way to, uh, and is there another? Uh, well, there are. Um, there's so this the, one, which, which, which is a lot, lot of articles, and this yeah. one, which is book recommendations. Which That's one fine. are you wanting now, me to show? Now, it, now, all, now it's in the recording. Everything, okay. all the slides are in the recording, right? Uh, yes. So just, so, oh, yeah. Okay. So, All right. So we'll now open the floor for discussion. Uh, if you'd like to speak. Uh, use your raised hand icon to indicate your interest in speaking. Dante, your mic is open. Hey, Mark. Uh, oh. Great presentation. Um, I had a few questions. Uh, you don't have to answer them all, uh, but I just wanted to ask them since I wrote them down um, during the presentation. So, um, so one, my first question is, uh, what were the debates around fascism leading up to the seventh Congress of the Comintern? And were there debates prior to the founding of the Comintern, like in the second international and such? Uh, my second question is, uh, how does Dimitrov's definition of, of fascism apply to those who are poor and currently in prison under the dictatorship of the bourgeoisie? Um, is that fascism? or no, and does it change under full-blown fascism as you described? Uh, my third question is how long has the popular front policy been policy of the CPUSA? And is there ever a plan in moving, from, moving away from it? Um, and on top of that, have any other communist parties um, uh, moved away from it? And then my last question, uh, this is short, probably a short answer. Um, uh, to it. Uh, Gus Hall uh, warned of a fascist danger in the 70s during Nixon's second administration. Um, what is different from them from, from then and now? And that's it. Thank you. Okay. Uh, okay. Maybe let me get a few more before I respond. Before we have to give people time to uh, raise que uh, make comments and raise questions. So before you respond, please. Yes. Um, Ishmael, your mic is open. Ishmael Para, your mic is open. Oh, yes, thank you. Um, I wrote down a couple of things. Uh, your remarks and presentation are inspirational because they really encompass the necessary breadth in, the, in understanding the construction of fascism. And also that allows us to see clearly what are different ways of struggle. The other thing is that one part of the class, particularly, and I don't think this was mentioned, and that is the organized section of our class, I think needs to be convinced uh, that work stoppage is one of, the, one of the valid options to the future advance of fascism, and also to the remaining of Trump trying to remain in the in the in the uh, in the White House something like that I think that is an important uh, question uh, that we should raise or, or look at or should be included in the remarks because 
if the Teamsters and the longshoremen went out for a week, the country would stop. And I think that's an important thing to understand about our class, that even sections of it are, are very, very strong and can and uh, can react in democratic ways to uh, oppose Trump. Um, I also think that uh, the imposition of a physical uh, violence by existing forces of repression and new forces of repression uh, are created uh, to psychologically and uh, physically impose acceptance by civil society to be relegated to a position of servitude at the hands of a single ruler representing the most backward forces of the ruling class. Thank you very much for a wonderful presentation. Okay, thank you. Looking for other hands. Well, Molly, while, while, while we're open. waiting, while we're waiting, maybe I could respond to those. Molly's mic is open. Oh. Okay. Thank you. Um, I wanted to share a brief story of what's going on in Cleveland um, with uh, this. Have to be very brief, Molly. Very brief. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. This presidential debate coming up. It's the first one in Cleveland on Tuesday. And we just had um, our revolution pull out of our protest because the police were um, are just so threatening. And I noticed in your presentation, you didn't mention the police as part of the fascist, um, like the elements, but I think you mentioned it, kind of insinuated it many times. So I guess mm -hmm. wanted to hear a little bit of clarity on that. Um, and secondly, like the, what happened with our revolution, I think had to do with gener generational divide. Um, and so any thoughts on bridging that? Um, I think the older folks in our progressive community in Cleveland and some of the older folks in, even in our party um, didn't want to go into the streets um, because of the fear of violence from the police. So thank you. Okay, a couple of more before turn it back over to you. Taryn, your mic is open. Uh, thanks so much for this uh, presentation tonight. Just to sort of follow up a little bit on the last question, or at least the spirit of the last question, I was wondering what the line is necessarily on self-defense, uh, because I can understand perspectives on violence um, as well as chaos in the street. But you know, when when these sorts of fascist paramilitaries are allowed to go into vulnerable communities, some people from those communities would consider that a threat to their safety, like an imminent threat to their safety, that hate crimes will be on the rise if these sorts of groups are permitted to sort of pass through. And so other groups might uh, argue that engaging with these uh, fascist elements on the street is sort of a, an aspect of self-defense. So I was just wondering if you could comment your perspective on that. Thank you so much again for a great presentation. One more. Zenobia, you had your hand up. Your mic is open. Yes, first of all, I want to say hello to everyone and how very much I enjoyed your presentation. It was right on time. And I want to say firstly, that several of the quotes that you took from Demetrius, I also underlined and I thought you was very timely. <laughs> thoroughly, thoroughly was immense with your presentation. Uh, early on, you mentioned something about folks really feeling how horrible things are now in terms of this, you know, fascism, because they were not aware historically of what happened in, in Germany in the, in the 20s and the 30s, you know. And I think that's a, a maybe uh, an issue that has to do with edu educating people with, with what was happening then, just as I found that people are more readily involved in the struggle around police brutality because it's out there for you now. Back 40 years or so, we didn't have video and things. So, but again, uh, thank you very much for a great presentation. Okay, Mark, I, I apologize to everyone uh, else. 
uh, uh, we now uh, need to turn the mic back over to Mark. Go on, Mark. Okay, uh, let me answer what I can or respond to what I can. Uh, there were indeed debates about fascism before 1935 in the Communist International, uh, and they ranged uh, all over uh, the map. Um, one of my book recommendations is a book by R. Palm Dutt, who was the editor of the British Party's theoretical journal for many decades. And he wrote a book uh, which was published in, I think, 1934 called uh, Fascism and Social Revolution. And in it, you can see the shift was in the process of happening and he hadn't quite shifted uh, totally to the popular front approach at that point. Uh, there were saying that the communists and the socialists in Germany should have cooperated is uh, much easier than the prospect of actually making it happen. There were real reasons and even good reasons why there was enmity and difficulty. And that rings true today. It's not that all liberals are militantly anti-fascist, they aren't. Uh, it's not that, um, and at any rate, I don't want to spend too much time on that, but there there were significant debates. Uh, is fascism just the worst of the capitalists or is it something different? Uh, should we uh, oppose it through military action or should we uh, be raising the, the, the struggle for socialism immediately? There were those kinds of debates. Um, and I'm not, I make no claims to be an expert in that, but that R. Palm Dutt book, uh, which you might find in a library, uh, uh, would illuminate some of that. Uh, I confess I have no idea about the Second International and what debates were there, so I won't try that. Uh, to the point about those in prison, those who are suffering under the steps that have already been taken, uh, I what I, that was what I was trying to address by saying there are terrible things happening right now, but it can get worse. And that's not denying how terrible they are. There are uh, people in prison who shouldn't be in prison. There are people being shot in the streets who should still be alive. There are people being put in the hospital and with, you know, from having been beaten, who will have health repercussions for the rest of their lives. There are people who have already lost their right to vote. There are all kinds of terrible things going on now. This is not to claim that those are not terrible and that they are not even, maybe some of them are fascist actions, but that's not the same as fascism in full control of state power, able to implement their will. One way to look at that is to look at those policies that Trump has proposed, which he has backed down from. He backed down when there was significant opposition on, in a number of things. I don't have them all in my head at the moment, but uh, if there was full-blown fascism, there's no backing down. They just implement what they want to implement and um, kill, if necessary, thousands of people in the streets in order to make it happen. So that's why I'm, it, I, I'm not trying to uh, uh, downplay or um, say it's the terrible things that are happening aren't terrible. They are, but it can get worse. Uh, and we need to stop fascism in order to have the democratic space to protest and organize for change to stop and reverse those terrible things. And if there's full-blown fascism, we will not have that option. Uh, on the question about popular front policies, the, the, our party has been following it uh, since the early 30s. In Dimitrov's speech, he, for example, uses the uh, United States Young Communist League as an example of how to build a broad popular front among the youth. Uh, there were other things that we were engaged in. So from the early 30s, at least, uh, our party was had a popular front policy. Uh, and as for, well, I, I will return to the question of how we get past that in response to a later question. Uh, Gus Hall indeed warned of 
Nixon's fascism. Nixon, for example, commissioned a study on what would happen if he canceled the 1972 elections. He was indeed had fascists around him, maybe personally was a fascist himself, but it's not about what they want. It's about what they think they can get away with and what they will risk in order to maintain power. And Nixon, uh, no matter what he would have personally liked, had lost the support of even Republican senators who came to him, including arch reactionary Goldwater, and told him he would be impeached, not just impeached in the House, but he would be convicted in the Senate impeachment trial. And it wasn't worth the fight, uh, that the cost was too high. Uh, Gus Hall also uh, warned in the 1980s about the whiff of fascism coming from the Republican, several Republican conventions uh, with the speeches of Pat Buchanan and warned that it would be more than a whiff. And with certainly the election of uh, George W. Bush, there was more than a whiff. They took some of those preparatory steps starting from stealing the 2000 election. Uh, and other things that they put into place. But there are differences between the steps towards fascism and full-blown fascism. Um, so that's part of the difference between then and now is that there was still room to struggle then and they managed to walk back from the precipice. Our situation is there is a chance to struggle, but they have a stronger foothold on power. They have made more steps against democracy in the meantime. They are farther along in the process. So our struggle has to escalate become of that, uh, because of that. Um, certainly organized workers striking as an option which can bring uh, bring the system to a halt, bring the economy to halt in a matter of days. However, it's not a matter of our convincing or preaching. Workers have to learn that through their own experience. It's through the process of struggle that workers learn that lesson. And if they are in the process of struggle, then when we go to them and say, here's something you can do, it's not just because it's an idea, it's because it will match their experience. They will understand why they need to do it and why they need to take the risks of it. That's part of why masses in motion is the key, not because it gives us an opportunity to preach at them, it gives us an opportunity to be with them in the process of struggle as they learn their own lessons from their own experience, fighting from their own needs. And they may not be revolutionary right now, they may not be ready to strike, much less general strike over it. Words won't convince them our actions and their own experience of struggle will convince them. And that's also the antidote to the psychological imposition where they're trying to convince the entire population that it doesn't matter what you do, we're gonna win no matter what. Uh, there are, uh, in response to Molly, there are generational divides and uh, other kinds of divides, issues of trust, uh, historical issues of, uh, for example, parts of the labor movement uh, being in favor of environmentally destructive construction projects or pipelines and the environmental movement being totally opposed. Those things can only be solved in the process of struggle, in fighting for unity, in putting the unifying issues as the most important. And that's what it will enable us to overcome those divisions. Um, I, I don't have any handy thing other than that to say how to overcome generational divides, uh, but it doesn't come from attacking other parts of the people you're trying to ally with, trying to win them to that unity, win all sides of it to the unity, whether that involves compromise or um, whatever it involves, it's the unity and the joint struggle that is the important thing. Uh, the police are part of the fascist movement to the extent that uh, they will obey orders and fire on the populace. And indeed, we've seen lots of examples of that and examples of the police uh, 
protecting the right-wing protesters and attacking uh, left-wing protesters or even just democratic protesters. We've seen lots of examples of that and we will see more over the next month and probably over the next four or five months. Uh, and they are part of that. But because the police forces are not a unified nat national force under the sole direction of Trump, um, it's not a sole organized force for fascism in the way that, say, uh, the, the street stormtroopers are, or the uh, organized multimillionaires and billionaires are, or the uh, conspiracy theorists are. Uh, they are, uh, we still have the opportunity to prevent them from becoming. What happened in, in Germany is that after the accession to power of Hitler, the police forces will become nationalized and under Trump's direct orders in a way that they aren't now. Uh, but you're right, that is another uh, a political force that is primarily in support of fascism, but not universally. Similarly with the military, Trump stupidly has alienated much of the military uh, instead of um, trying to seduce them. Uh, and they will be, if he attempts to overthrow the election, what happens in the military of import is of importance. And hence, great importance should rest on those retired military leaders and even some current, currently serving military leaders who talk about their um, oath to the Constitution, not to a person or not to to the office of the presidency and the commander in chief, not to the person of Trump. It's not because they're allies of the progressive movement. It's because if there is resistance in the military, that will make it difficult for him to use the military in a unified way to impose full-blown fascism. Uh, on the issue of self-defense, I'm absolutely not arguing against self-defense. Uh, we all have the right to self-defense. We have all the right have the right to protect ourselves, but self-defense and engaging in the streets with the express purpose of engaging in street fighting with the fascists helps the fascists. If they attack us, we should defend ourselves, and the protests and the movements should defend themselves, and that's absolutely part of our democratic right to do so. However, a strategy of let's let them provoke us, let's engage with them, that's fighting on their turf. That's giving them the political victory. They don't care if they lose a particular street battle. They don't care if some of them are martyrs. They want to be. Um, anyway, enough about that. Um, so, Again, and in response to uh, uh, Zenobia's comment, indeed, uh, there are fascist actions now, uh, and the things that are happening are deserving of being called fascists. We just shouldn't confuse that with full-blown fascism. We shouldn't then think that because uh, there are terrible things happening now, therefore, what, what will happen if Trump wins another election will just be another four years of the same shit. It will be worse. He will take a Trump victory, even a pretend victory, as a mandate to immediately go to even worse policies, even more far-reaching uh, attacks on democracy, even more people arrested, even more street violence. It will be worse. Um, and as Zenobia said, education is indeed a part of it, but communists and radicals and progressives can't substitute our own thinking for the experience of workers in struggle. Why they will be willing to listen to our education is because they learn in the process of struggle that what we're saying makes sense. It's a necessary thing for them to understand. They have to want the education. It's not just about having the right words or the right arguments. It's about being with them in the struggle and they're learning the need for more in the process of that struggle. And that's why, as AOC said, mass movements are the answer. 
so I and thank you for the compliments. I much appreciate them, and I hope it's been uh, a helpful uh, presentation for the work that we have to do in the next month, and then in the next uh, months up to the inauguration, and then prepare for a whole new struggle afterwards. Oh, there was one other thing I said I would address uh, later, which is that the plan to move beyond and path the popular front approach uh, is not something that's up to us. It's up to the political conditions in which we find ourselves. It's not a matter of our will. It's a matter of the actual political circumstances we are faced with. Um, so if we are faced with full-blown fascism, we will still have to struggle. Another book that I mention uh, in my book recommendations is one called Communist Resistance in Nazi Germany, in which he are, the author argues that communists were the only internal German force that offered consistent protracted and never-ending opposition to the fascist dictatorship. It's not that they were the only ones who were opposed or the only ones who fought, but they were the main ones, not only in other countries, not only in the resistance, not only in those com company, countries that engaged in World War II and defeated fascism, but within Germany itself, and that will be ahead of us. But if you read the book, you will understand how much more difficult our struggle would become if we have fascism, and that will change our strategy. Right now, our best defense is an aggressive offense to help Biden win the election, to fight for the most implementation of the most progressive elements of his program, to fight to uh, pressure him to make those programs more progressive, and to educate and lay the basis while we're in struggle with millions of people on their immediate needs and their own struggles to explain to them why the system is the enemy and the system needs to be changed in fundamental ways, economic, political, social, cultural, and educational. Uh, but that isn't something that's just up to us. It's up to the actual real world circumstances in which we find ourselves and this is a process of trying to change those circumstances but that's not a decision changing them is not a decision we get to make it's a process which we get to be a part of so i'm, I'm done now responding thank you very much <laughs> okay on behalf of everyone i'd like to thank mark for his presentation tonight i'd like to remind everyone please do join us october 18th uh, for the class on China. It will probably also be a long class, uh, so uh, please be prepared. I don't think any of us were prepared tonight, but uh, we survived. All right. Thank you, everyone, and good night.